great conspiracy. You know, this conspiracy has gone on since the beginning of time, but it grows every year. What is that? This is where your true enemy lies, and you don't want to be deceived. The controversy is between our Heavenly Father and Satan. That's the great controversy, and that would be the title of this particular lecture. It's to know the enemy and to know what weapons you must have if you're a soldier of Almighty God, speaking in the spiritual sense. What are you armed with? How do you face it? And don't, um, don't ever count yourself out and waste your time. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Know your enemy and know how to win. Okay. We wrestle not against the power of flesh necessarily. And we have power over every evil spirit. Don't you ever let an evil spirit come into your family, start arguments, get you to even biting at each other. Stop it. You're allowing the enemy to win when you allow such junk as that. Okay. So know your enemy and recognize him when he raises his little head okay, and put a stop to it. You have the power and the authority as a child of God to do that. So you do it without any hesitation and you discipline yourself in that. Keep order, love, and peace in your family. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's talk about this conflict just a little bit, this controversy. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, with that word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness, that's the humility and gentleness of Christ, uh, who in, pre in presence am base among you. I, I'm humble there among you, but being absent and bold toward you. In this letter, I'm going to pop the whip just a little bit. We're going to get it straight. Verse 2. But I beseech you, I really want to reason with you. I want you to think about this. Consider it. That I may not be bold when I am present with, thy com with that confidence wherein I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. You, you would think of us that we only have things of the flesh in mind. Don't, don't ever go there, my friend. That'll get you in trouble. Always think on a higher plane. Know that your Heavenly Father is always with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And even in a group, if you're not careful, it's kind of normal to think... Um, in the, well, I wonder what that person's in it for. You know? Every person's in it to have help from Almighty God, to find peace of mind, to receive God's blessings. And all of God's elect, without, without, ex without exception, because you can mark one of God's elect in this manner, they always have compassion for other people. They want to be able to help other people. It's a mark to pass the word, to pass the good news. Why, there's plenty for everybody. Nobody's going to go without. It'll go around. There's plenty to feed everyone the word of truth. <clears throat> Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's not necessary. Our battle is not with flesh, but with Satan and, and principalities in higher places. He'll come right into your home and mess you up if you let him. Okay. And he has some of the mar most marvelous little ways of working into your home. Usually he will start, well, aren't you all the greatest? Aren't, you all are just exceptional, but really you all fall short. Okay. And then he starts. And then trouble begins to happen. Nip it in the bud. Don't let things like that start in your family. It's of the flesh. Think higher. We're not warring against flesh. You might say, well, those people offended me. Well, they're ignorant. 
They don't know any better. You do. That makes a big difference. You can afford to have passion and compassion on people. You, know, you can overlook when somebody's a child, you overlook them. And when somebody's acting childish, as long as it's doing no harm, you can overlook that and feed them truth or something that will pick them up and bring them along. In other words, you're warring against something maybe they can't even see. Something evil right over them. Evil spirits, evil thoughts, or evilness within themselves. That's what the war is against, not flesh. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it is mighty. The power of God, dunamis, that's where our word dynamite comes from. I mean, when you, when you are tuned in spiritually and you order something negative out in the name of Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus the Christ, it's going. Okay. You don't have to put up with it. You take authority. And you know something? If you're among people that do not understand, you don't even have to say it out loud. Christ hears you, and he puts a stop to it. Always take charge. When you're in charge, then take charge. Don't take, well, if I had only known. You do know. We're not warring against flesh. We're warring against spiritual places and high powers. Satan, do not let him rule you around. Well, how do I know it's really him? Smell. Okay, look, feel, you will know uh, if you've got any spiritual discernment at all. It's, that's no step for a stepper. If you're a child of God, you know and can understand. Our weapons are strong. What is that weapon? It's Christ. He's with us. And you know something? He's very jealous of you. When you truly love him, he doesn't want somebody messing with you any more than you would want somebody messing with one of your children or one of your friends. So you put a stop to it. That's the way it goes. That's what the controversy is about. That that is good and that that is evil. <laughs> For the pulling down of those strongholds, to continue in verse 5, casting down imaginations, and that's reasonings and sometimes false reasonings, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's discipline. You know, get rid of traditions of men. Do not let those slip into your family. Stay with the simplicity in which Jesus Christ teaches and use that power. It pulls down the strongholds, cleanses your home, yourself, and you're going to find happiness. Most of all, well, how do you know and how can you guarantee you're going to find happiness? God's going to bless you. He's going to bless your work, your savings. He's going to bless you in every way if you're honest with him. And if you will use that power and authority. And most of all, if you use common sense. Well, how can he bless my savings? Don't be wasteful. Don't go buying a bunch of junk you don't need, especially if you're buying it on credit. You know, only a fool would do that. Think about it. And I'm not calling anybody a fool. I said only you wouldn't do that, but a fool would. Verse 6, And having in, all, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Keep order, okay, spiritually speaking. 7, do you look on things after the outward appearance? Question. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, that you belong to him, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. In other words, you've got some people that claim to be Christian and you want to be careful. You know, they may, it's real easy for the mouth to say something but how do you judge spiritual discernment? Just because someone says, this is to keep fake Christians out of your home, out of your life. Do good buddies, okay? Goody, goody, two shoes. But never doing anything of God's work. 
And so he wants you to be careful of that and use discipline. Uh, you know, there's one thing. You show me a home without discipline, and I'll show you a home that's not much of a home. You show me a church that does not have discipline, and I'll show you a church that's not much of a church. You show me a nation that does not have discipline, and I'll show you a nation that's pretty soon going to be on the rocks. So these things are very, very important. You spiritually discern, for you're not. Our controversy is not with flesh. Don't you ever let anyone draw you or lead you into it through flesh. It's spiritual. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Verse 9, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. And he continues on. What, what is edification? It's to edit, to take out the bad and put in that that's good. The Word of God will do that for you. That's why you study his word. That's why you stay in his word. It edits out the negativity within your family, within yourself, and your community. It's catching, very catching. And why? Well, because God's going to bless you when you strive, when you uh, put on the gospel armor, when you're a good soldier for him, spiritually speaking now. He's going to bless you. But why would he do that? Because he loves you. God, you know, so many people paint God as somebody with a pitchfork going out to zap somebody. He loves his children. You love your children, don't you? Well, so does he. So don't try to paint that negative picture of him. He wants to help. And anytime you ask for that help, it's going to be there. Okay, he's going to love you. Let's go to the book of Timothy. <clears throat> Excuse me, Second Timothy. Second Timothy, verse 1. And Second Timothy, verse 1 reads, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace is unmerited favor. It is love. Be strong in that love that Christ sends to you, for you. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, <clears throat> excuse me, the same commit thou to faithful men. No gender here, women also who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, don't sit on it. Don't just keep it to yourself. If it's good news, share it. At the same time, don't cast your pearls before swine, but at the same time, when somebody is hungry, feed them. Feed them with truth. Give them, give them something in their life to know that God loves them and that he's there for them. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. You know, you're going to take your share of the bumps. You know, anytime you claim to be a strong Christian in today's world because of political correctness, uh, you're going to be laughed at. But you know something? You'll have the last laugh, though you won't be laughing but you'll be looking at them as they pay and you receive rewards. Don't ever forget that. Take your part, and if there's hard knocks, knocks comes along, bring it on. We can cut it. Why? God chose you, and he wasn't playing guesswork. He said, that's one of my little ones that, just like he said to Satan concerning Job, hey, he can handle himself. Boy, Satan tore old Job up every way but loose. Job still stayed true, so will you. Take the hard knocks with it in life from the flesh. They can't help it. They're ignorant. Okay. And, and I love them. Don't, don't think I'm saying talking against them or talking down to them. I love them. That's why I dedicated my life to teaching the Word, so that we could teach that Word and get that good news to whomsoever would. Verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth, him, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Uh, 
that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, you don't let your own, you, you take the knocks and the bumps, and you don't let your own little problems get in the way of sharing the truth. Sometimes that's very difficult, and sometimes, uh, you know, that's, uh, but that's a testing. And you want to always remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where God said, there's nothing going to happen to you that doesn't happen to everybody else. And I will never test you over what you can handle. And I will always show you a way out. Just hang tough. And God's elect are tough. You know, they can, they can cut a wide swath and leave a big wake for people to follow and to be blessed by. That's so ever important to share that truth, that word, that love, that understanding. That makes you a good soldier for Almighty God. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. This even has to do in, in the field of athletics. Uh, you've got to work at it. You've got to practice. You've got to train. But even then, you've got to do it lawfully. You can't um, take a shortcut across the track and take the trophy. Okay? Life doesn't work that way. And uh, we've got winners of many blue ribbons right here in this congregation. So uh, never take shortcuts. They always win that race, and I mean win it proudly. Okay. Be prepared. This works also spiritually. Well, how do I, how do I exercise, exercise your mind in God's work? Okay. And it will always pay dividends because the moment you need that truth, no one can take that away from you. You've got it. You claim it. It's yours. The husbandman, that's to say the farmer, that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. In other words, if he gets out there and hunts it, he's, he's going to get the profits, the first one to be able to share that. If you teach God's word, guess what? You're the first one that gets to share the blessings. That's what he's saying to you here. I'm watching, he's saying, I'm watching you, and you will have first fruits when you get out there and get with it. Consider, verse 7, consider, this is, you think, you reflect on this. What I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Ask him if you have trouble understanding. He'll open your mind up. He will. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That's the seed line foretold by the prophets, the gospel brought forth from time. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even into bonds, but the word of God is not bound. In other words, I'm, Paul was here in prison, and he, he, he was. He was in bounds, bonds. But he said, that doesn't stop me, and that doesn't change the word. The word is still true, and, and I will continue teaching that word even though I'm here in jail. Okay. Well, why was he in jail? Did he break the law? No. He taught God's word, and that got him thrown in jail. No, no um, excuse for uh, need be given for Paul. He was gallant, gallant in teaching that word and keeping that word uh, going, okay? Uh, and he would suffer that trouble. Verse, I suffered trouble as, in verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's the whole point. This life is pretty short, you know. Give it a hundred years, that's still short compared to the eternity. And how wonderful it's going to be there. And what he's saying is, you get out there and work in the field, you're going to be the first fruits there. You share with me, I'm going to share with you. Do you know something? He means it. That's the blessings. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying. You can count on it. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Um, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. You don't ever want to do that. Okay. 
Uh, poor old Peter said, denied him thrice, that the crucifixion is an example to us. Never do that. And then Christ forgave him. How ashamed he was. Verse 14. For of these things, put them in remembrance. Who? The people. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearer. That is to say, to give them hope. To give that hearer that's confused and distressed hope and happiness. That's what God's Word will do. It's catching. And it brings life. It pumps life. Not just life in this flesh, but eternal life. With Him forever. Into the very body of Christ. 7.15 to complete our work here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And to rightly divide that word of truth is to know who, what, when, and where. What it's talking about. So that you can accurately teach it, share it with others, and bring hope and blessings a purpose. You know, a life without a purpose is what a waste. What, what really a big waste for nobody to have a purpose in life, to want to accomplish something, to want to not want to accomplish eternal life, to be with their family from all the way back to Adam. Forever in the glory and the presence of Almighty God with everything so beautiful, wonderful, peaceful, and everything negative having been done away with. What a place to live. And what a place to be. You just can't imagine. Difficult to imagine in the flesh the grandeur, the wonder and the beauty of being with Him and also in being in that spiritual body that doesn't age, doesn't get sick, it doesn't get the flu, it's just perfect because he created it that way. What, what a blessing it is. So when you war, know what you're warring against. Know that it's not flesh and blood. And don't ever let anyone drag you into that trap or you're no better than they are. You've got to study to show yourself approved. In other words, somebody that is ignorant, and, and ignorant is not a bad word. It simply means they don't know any better. If they begin arguing with you, then rise above that. They don't know. They just simply don't know. So have patience. And you want to be glad that your father has patience as it is written, as it is written in the um, uh, second Peter chapter three, along about seven or eight, that God is long suffering. It means he's got lots of patience waiting for his children waiting for them to grow up, waiting for them to study to show themselves approved, waiting for them to say, Father, I love you. I need you. And then he reaches down and touches you, blesses your life, gives you that purpose, whereby you can share that with others so that they can feel that blessing and know that life is worth something. Life is worthwhile. You know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He never takes something away that it isn't a better place anyway. We thank our Father and love Him uh, for that. Now, uh, naturally, you knew with this subject, sooner or later I was going to end up in Ephesians chapter 6. Turn there. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, I bet most of you could, read, could quote what we're about to read, and that's good, but it's befitting that we cover it now. Chapter 6, verse 10, the great book of Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Don't, don't be a wimp, okay? It's, it's one thing to be humble and meek, 
But don't be a wimp. Don't be afraid. Because you're a child of God. Act like it and look like it. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, that you may what? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's kind of simple, isn't it? We're going to take this armor one piece at a time. You put it on and Satan can't touch you. Got it? Let's go with it. Verse 12, for we wrestle, let's, we, don't, we, we fight not against flesh and blood. You've got to let that soak into your mind. Don't let flesh and blood anger you or rile you. Don't let ignorance rile you. You've got to rise above that. You've got to discipline yourself. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, that's Satan. Against spiritual wickedness in high places, all the way to heaven, right by Michael, the throne of God, and Michael holding Satan captive there now, all but his evil spirit. But he's given you power over that evil spirit for you to handle it. So handle it. You can. You don't have to put up with it. But you got to have this armor on and in place or you're kind of standing there defenseless. 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. It's coming. It's here. And having done all to stand. You've either got to stand for something or you're worthless. You stand for nothing. And I, you know, I... I don't, don't uh, put some soldier in Christ's army that won't stand for anything. We can't use him, send him home. Don't need him, send him home. Because anytime you get into war, somebody like that's going to let you down. You can count on it. You don't need any wimps that will not partake of the armor, trust it, and know you can count on it. Because he's not going to let you down. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate is, protects you, it's justification. Let everything you do be just. But what is this that you have around your loins? It's your belt that holds your britches up. Well, what is it? The truth. The truth will hold your britches up and save you a lot of embarrassment. You better be belted up, girded up. You know, you see, men wore skirts during the time of many of the old writings. And when you girded yourself up, you took your belt and put it through your, do they call it a skirt? I don't think so, but I'll call it that because I don't know what else to call it. And pull that up where your legs were free and you could fight, okay? You could do war. But you do that and girt yourself up with truth. So that when an adversary comes against you, your quiver, all you've got to do is reach up here and pull out an arrow of truth and fire that rascal. Okay. Shoot it. And let the truth do the work. And you'll be just fine. Okay. You can trust the armor of God. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that you're ready to march when God would insinuate, when the Holy Spirit indicates, and those shoes are made for walking and moving wherever he wants you to go, that um, he can utilize you, that you can move to the, to the front of the adversary if that's what it takes, and take him on. Why? Because you've got power over him. In, um, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, Christ gave us power over all of our enemies, but you've got to have the courage to use it. Okay? You've you got to be man or woman or child of God enough to say, I believe that and I'm, I'm all hornest with it. Bring it on. And Satan will run from you. you know, if somebody is possessed, evil spirits will flee at the very mention of the name of Yeshua Messiah and the oil of our people. You got the power. Never be afraid to use it. That's what you have that armor on for. Well, 
do I ever get to take the armor off? Why would you want to? Okay. It's a spiritual thing. Sleep in it. Okay. Sleep with your boots on, so to speak, all right? They're made for walking. And you be ready. Okay. I'm speaking spiritually here. You kids can take your shoes off tonight when you go to bed, okay? No problem. Verse 16. Above all, most important, taking the shield of faith. Well, what's the shield? It's Christ. You have him out in front of you. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, if you have Christ in front of you as a shield, nothing can get through. All the fiery darts. Anything Satan wants to throw at you, it's not going to make it. And take the helmet of salvation. In other words, you have that salvation on your head. That's where your mind is. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God makes a powerful sword. You can debate, you can cut, you can slice. When you are armed with that Word of God, there's nothing evil can stand against that. You have a double whammy on it. You've got the power of the word, plus you have he overlooking you. And you're going to win. You can count on it. That's God's way, and that's the gospel armor. 18, very important, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, that's to say for all of the elect, being careful for that. And, um, and, and so it is that we leave it there. The gospel armor. What does that have to do with you primarily? As You know, if you were to read Acts chapter 2, we're not going there. It would say, I've got some sons and daughters that are armed with that in the end times. They're going to stand against the false one. But where was that written? What did Peter say along about in verse 14? He said, this is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet. So speaking of Joel, let's go there. What were they talking about? That's where you find out, not in the book of Acts. Joel the prophet. In the book of Joel, you have the locust army, which is Satan's army, that comes against God's children. And guess what? They lose. <laughs> I've read the book, okay? They lose. So pick it up, if you would, in chapter 2, the great book of Joel. And, um, and we're going to take it from there. And Joel meaning Yahweh is God. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you in the Hebrew tongue. Okay? Verse 25, concerning that locust army, the thing that's important to you, you know that God even controls it or allows it. Verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the pommel worm, worm my great army which I sent among you. In other words, that's the four stages of the locust. That's all very important in prophecy, not a different lecture for a different time. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Not if you'll keep that gospel armor on and know who you're warring against. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So don't ever worship some stick or some man or somebody else. You worship your Father, Almighty God. And it shall come to pass afterward, this is important, this is where you come in, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, both men and women, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. This is when the Antichrist is right here on earth, the head of that locust army. That's your destiny. That's your purpose. That's what you're warring against. And guess what? 
you win. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That's divine judgment. Many people, we had a prelude of this when Mount St. Helens blew her stack. And that face appeared in the smoke of that God's own touch saying, this is it. We're closing in to the generation of the fig tree. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, and the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call, you are that remnant, that remnant that will keep that gospel armor on and in place. Do you know what the next chapter starts with? The Valley of Jehoshaphat. Do you know what Jehoshaphat means in the Hebrew tongue? Valley of Judgment, where the great white throne judgment takes place. Have you ever read what happens there? And you know, why, why I want you to absorb this, so many people are worried about the nations, the terrorists, wickedness in the world. You don't have to. Our Father is still on the throne. And as long as you obey him, and as long as you serve him, you've got nothing to worry about. Go Chapter 3, verse 9, book of Joel, right here, cross over the next column. <clears throat> Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. This word Gentile should be translated nations, and it means non-Christian, non-godly nations. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. I mean, you dress them up, you put on the best thing they've got. This is anything that will come against Almighty God. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. You pump them up and put, it, put them on, you know, many times they even put them on drugs, quite frankly. I've been there, done that, okay? I've witnessed the enemy so drugged up that uh, they were pretty easy picking sometimes. Okay? They, they do anything to pick people up in severe times. Assemble yourselves and come all you heathen. Gather yourselves together round about to the cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. And he will. Let the, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the valley of judgment. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. And guess what? His word carries. Always has. It always will. You're on his side. You've got nothing to worry about. And you know something? Though this sounds so bad, and how many will we be able to convert before this transpires? Hopefully during the millennium, quite a few. So no one understand. This is the last dregs after the great white throne judgment. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and get ye down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's thrashing on the thrashing floor. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of, his of the children of Israel, those ten tribes that scattered north over the Caucasus Mountains, later many of them settling in this great nation, America and Canada and other parts of the world and citizens everywhere that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that are in the army of God, not to destroy, but to save, to help, to encourage, to lead, to guide, and share the beauty of eternal life with whomsoever will. That's the beauty of the message of salvation, the war that great controversy between Satan and your Heavenly Father 
Which side are you on? I don't even have to ask you, I know, or you wouldn't be here. But make sure you understand who you're warring against. Don't waste yourself on flesh. Don't argue with flesh. Observe the higher calling of spiritual. And observe what the problem is spiritually and see if you can fix it. Ask God to fix it. And you'll be a blessing to all the people you come in contact with. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father. Thank you for your word, for your truth, for your protection, Father, for your power that you have loaned to us, Father, to utilize when needed. May the gospel armor, as you have promised, always protect as we know it will. What a comfort the comforter is. Thank you, Father, in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. It's like... A lot of times, though, the reason people have trouble with it is, I'm going to use an old country saying, okay? It's like this. If you're with a preacher that doesn't spread out, it's like putting a cow out to graze with a 10-foot rope. That's when people stake their milk cow out, put her on a 10-foot rope. She can only eat what is it within that 10-foot circle. That's it. As far as she's concerned, that's the end of the world. Or you can give her a 50-foot rope, and man, I mean, she can get out there and take in a lot more grazing. Well, so it is if you really teach God's Word, and you let people, you take the blinders off and let them see the first earth age, and God's beauty of creation, and his correction of Satan by destroying the first earth age, whereby the people that followed him could have an opportunity for salvation, the love of God. It's a beautiful thing. No difference in science and God's Word. Uh, Cheryl from Utah. I was baptized as a child, but I'm no longer a member of that church. I would like to be rebaptized in my new finding of Christianity. What are your thoughts? And I love your teaching. Well, I'm glad you love the teaching. I can't answer that for you because if you, if you were old enough to understand there are many churches, but there's only one Christ. And if you were old enough to understand you were being baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection, stating, I publicly believe, I am a believer, then you are baptized. But that's, that's up to you. If you did not know that, then the choice is yours, and you would have to go from there. Evelyn from Florida, my comment and question is, my husband recently began attending a church in the hall because he also wanted to study the Bible. He also watches your program at times, but has been corralled in, into this other church. We have always celebrated Christmas the traditional way and never worshiped the tree, Christmas tree. But now my husband is telling me that a Christmas tree is offensive to God. He cannot find any passage in the Bible to state that but says that it is a pagan holiday and an abomination. Would you please give me a solid explanation? Well, he's never read the Bible too good then, has he? Because in the great book of Hosea, which means salvation, where God would even call the people lo ami and ami, which means not my people, and then claimed them and said they are my people. In Hosea chapter 14, verse 8, God said, I am a great fir tree. In other words, the fir tree is symbolic of that. That's what he was talking about. Why? Well, it's evergreen. It always has green leaves, meaning it's ever living. You don't worship it. It's just that that's what it stood for. Okay. Again, Hosea 14.8, God himself, I am a great fir tree. And, um, and so it is, and you know, the cedar, the evergreen, it's always, uh, it's amazing when you make a study even of the horticulture of the plant. A, a lot of uh, old timers we know because back before they brought out so many chemicals to, I mean, spray a bug and whoop, it's gone, you had to have cedar chest and things of that nature to keep moths out of your clothing. What a, what a beautiful thing that that wood protects and guards. But he, he solid. Evergreen, meaning he doesn't, he doesn't have leaves part of the year. He's a year-round God. Now, 
I, I don't, um, I, I highly recommend Christ was conceived on December the 25th. He was not born on December the 25th. That's real easily documented in Luke chapter 1, all right? And between this period and Christmas time, we will give the Christmas lecture. And we really want to or order the Christmas tape. And it goes into biblical detail on the events and so be it. But again, having you read Hosea chapter uh, 14, verse 8, and I think you'll be happy. Alice from New York. Pastor Murray, I have the Christmas tape, but I am still confused. How do you know it was June the 13th and 19th? Can you direct me as to how to I can document this in the Bible? Well, I, I sure can. But you're going to have to go a little deeper. You're going to have to take your companion Bible and, and go to the appendix number 179. Appendix 179. It will educate you on the 24 courses. Abaya is a date itself. That's how I can know it was that date. Uh, the, the appendix 179 in the companion Bible will teach you in detail. Quite a long study, but it's there for you just for the looking. James from uh, Georgia, can, can you clarify when Christ returns? Please document with scripture. Matthew 24, 30. Okay. After Antichrist's reign is over and done, the seventh trump sounds and here he comes. So Christ comes at the seventh trump. Another wonderful place you, you will find is um, in um, the Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The two witnesses rise from the streets of Jerusalem. The seventh trump sounds, and here comes Christ. Christ comes at the seventh trump. The most important thing you want to know is the Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. That's why his number is 666. He comes at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth seal, sixth vial. Christ comes at the seventh seal, the seventh trump, and the seventh vial. No problem. That's your dates. Brandon, uh, your chronological order. Brandon from Wisconsin. Is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet all the same person or three different people? It, it's the same person. For every negative, there is a positive. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have Satan, the dragon, the, the Lucifer, the devil, the Antichrist. He goes by seven or eight names, Little Horn, and so forth. Satan uses many names, but it's just one person. And he deceives a lot of people. He can turn on love like love has never turned on before to deceive people into thinking he's Messiah. And as it is written in Revelation chapter 13, following verse 11, after he appears, hey, it looks like the lamb slain. Looks like Jesus Christ. He even has the power, like it's got horns. That's what power means. Horns being rather is power. But when he speaks, it's the voice of the dragon. I mean, it's none other than Satan himself claiming to be Christ. And it goes on and states in verses uh, 13, 12, 13, 14, he performs miracles in the sight of people. I mean, people in this world can see it. Fabulous things. Let me tell you something. The churches are not gearing people to handle something like that, even though it's written in God's Word. They better get to it, because it's going to happen before too long. Brenda, Brenda from uh, Illinois. Where can I purchase the Companion Bible? Right here from Shepherd's Chapel. Um, request, uh, you can call or request the book list or whatever, okay? They'll send it to you. Wayne from New Mexico. Hi, and thank you for all you do at the chapel. You are so welcome. It is a blessing to be able to study with you all. My question is regarding Ephesians 2.2. 2. I look in my Strong's and the word world, 20. 889 is cosmos, and I look at my um, greens in a linear, and it's 165 age. Can you please expand, expand on this? Stick with Strong's. Strong is for the strong. Uh, greens has made an error or two. I find another error of his, a very bad one, in 
Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 11, verse 1, 2, 3. Okay. Where he changes expatio in the Greek, which means wholly seduced, to a different word. And that's bad. But stick to your strongs and you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, I still, I, I want to make one thing very clear. The Greens is probably the best inexpensive set of manuscripts you can get your hands on. But beware his translation. But the manuscripts are accurate. And that's why I recommend the Greens is so that you have a copy if you wish to study in that depth of the best Greek Hebrew and Aramaic manuscript you're going to find in today's time at the least cost. And it, it is one of the ways that you can go into the Genesis chapter two, three, 1, 2, and 3 and understand what God meant when he said not just Adam but Eth Ha-Adam in the Hebrew tongue to see the difference in men created at that time. Uh, Linda K. from Idaho. When God said he is preparing a mansion for us and we will uh, walk the streets of gold, is this when we die or when Christ returns or after the millennium? Well, it's according, you're not going to walk those streets. Gold simply means it's purity. If there's no sin there uh, or anything of that nature, okay? It's spiritual. Uh, that, that truly will be during the millennium time and the eternity. But the mansion is a different story. You read that in St. John chapter 14, which I quoted earlier about if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, same chapter. But the word in the Greek is mino, mansion. But do you know what it means? You know, when you put, when you translate mino to mansion, people visualize, oh, I'm going to have this huge home in the sky. Uh, that's not what it means at all. It means a resting place. And you know what ultimately it means? It means is the abode is the same word mono and mino. Mino and mono. Okay, in that same chapter. It's when God dwells with you. You can do that right now. When you dwell in Christ, he is your rest. Meaning you find peace of mind. The only peace of mind you're going to find in this world is in Christ. And that's mentioning or resting with him, sabbathing with him. Do you know what the word Sabbath means in the Hebrew tongue? It means rest. Okay. So he is our rest, and you can partake of that today through the Comfortur. That was his promise in 14 of John, that that Comforter would come. And he did. It's the Holy Spirit. That's God's Spirit with us today. And boy, will it give you blessings and bring you peace of mind. Uh, Patricia from uh, Kentucky. I have, I have brain damage and I have very many problems. I've broken my neck and spine and I'm not being a poor me baby, but I have a problem spreading God's word. He has blessed me to the point that I can now live alone and take care of myself. He is so good. Am I to talk to others of the truth you have shown me? And how can I tell others? Well, you, you, what you do is if the opportunity comes along, then you plant a seed. But only God can make it grow. Don't, don't dump the whole load on them. Just, and then if they question you, answer the question. And let God cause it to grow. Okay? But do you know something, dear? You are a fantastic example and witness to love the Lord and to study his word the way you do when you're handicapped to that point. It makes a lot better witness than I do. Because a non-believer is going to say, how can she still believe when she has a broken neck and, and yet look at her. God has blessed her that she can take care of herself. What a witness. You're doing real good, but don't, don't over, you know when you're fishing, you just put the bait out there and you move it just a little bit. You don't throw the anchor at them, okay? I don't want you to get hurt is what I'm telling you. Just be very gentle in your fishing and fish for men, and you'll do good. You're doing good already. Juanita from Tennessee. For 12 years, our family has studied with Shepherd's Chapel. We really enjoy studying. Thank you. Revelation 27, Satan has been released. 
Satan goes, in verse 8, goes out to deceive the nations. Fire comes down, the white throne judgment. Question, would this be the second death for these people? Well, if they follow, the second death is you will find in the last two verses of that 20th chapter. If at the great white throne judgment, if they followed Satan after he was released a short time, they walk into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Be me, done, over. And I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse to verse verse by verse, verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. Oh, does he? He really does. And when you make his day, boy, does he make yours. Brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, most of all, though, you listen to me, stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word.